Hi and welcome. Today we're going to talk about design principles. So when thinking about an architecture, thinking about how you're going to build your software or your web application or just your system, you need to think in security from the start. Today we're going to talk about something called design principles. Maybe it should be security design principles. So first of all, let's talk about what is a principle. A principle is a fundamental truth or proposition that serves as a foundation for a system of, of, a, of belief or behavior for a chain of reasoning. Well, it sounds really good. So what is a software security design principle? A declarative statement made with the intention of guiding security design decisions in order to meet the goal of a system. So whenever we have something called security design principles, so those principles will help us to ensure security to our system. So let's talk about 10 different design principles today. First of all, I would like to uh, show you the software development cycle. It's just something I found. There are many different kinds of software development cycles. Even you can find them as a iterative phase, or you can find them as a waterfall phase, different kind of phase. It doesn't really matter which one you're using. They all kind of consist of the same steps as you can see in the circle here. When you are taking uh, the decisions about how to implement security and in, in more importantly, how, which software design principles you're going to choose, it is the first step in the planning and the analysis should as best, your best of your, of, of your abilities, prove that you've chosen the right software design principles. The other steps you can, um, in, in, in the circle shown, design, implementation, testing, integration, and maintenance, is not something I'm gonna talk about today, maybe in a future video. So let's look at some common principles before we look at the actual 10 different software secure principle. Dry is a well-known principle. Don't repeat yourself. So by showing this small piece of code here, you might even see that um, you have the same code puts. I will not repeat my code so many times you to think, oh, so it's all about that. Well, maybe, maybe not. Depending on how you build your system, it's very important to understand that don't repeat the same piece of code too many times because there's a slight chance or a bigger chance on some occasions that you will create an, an alteration to some part of code that will lead to a security breach or a vulnerability. The KISS principle, don't, uh, keep it simple, stupid, is another really good, uh, important principle when it comes to security. Whenever you are thinking about implementing security to a system, it is very good idea to, to, to try and think about it as simple as possible. Whenever you overdo something, you might even create a new vulnerability and that is not the interest when you're thinking about security. And Yakni you ain't gonna need it is another really important principle when it comes to security. I see way too many uh, programmers, way too many software engineers, and way too many of all those kind of titles I can keep call keep them coming, just throwing down functionality, saying we need this, we're gonna need this, we're gonna need that. But have you even even asked the question, are you gonna need this? Is it a nice to have or a need to have? Another way of asking the same question the question is Yakni. So do you need the account recovery function that might open up a, a weak spot. It, it, it is a weak spot in your application in most occasions. So I would say think about what you're gonna do before um, you do it. So the best developers are the lazy ones. Well, in a way, I would say I agree with that because the lazy developers do not implement a lot of different kind of functionalities just back and forth uh, because they just need to do that. So let's look at the software design principles now. The very first one uh, page is uh, an overview of the 10 different design principles we're gonna look at. I just wanna say that if you go to Google and search for software design principle, you will just find a lot of different hits, okay? You can find many different top five, top three, top 10, top 20, top whatever. You know, I, I, you should do that. But to start someplace, I chose these 10, also the 10 design principles that I use in my classes. So let's change the page. 
assign the least privilege. That is all about assigning the least amount of privilege to any user, process, or whatever it's assigned to that is needed. So only the exact amount of privilege should be granted to a user to do a certain operation. If you don't do that, there's a great chance that that user can do too much and that could lead to a vulnerability or even a greater exploit at some point in the future. Separate responsibilities. Think about it this way. If you have a lot of mm, modules in your code and on one module have access to some other features that the same module have, that is another module. It sounds complicated. You have two different modules. They should have totally separate responsibilities. You have an admin and a user. Don't don't mix them together as one module because there is a chance that you might get access to a method or function within that module if all users in theory have access to it. This is why you might say, but didn't you just say dried and repeat yourself? I did say that. Think about this way. If admin is accessing a page, is that the same kind of functionality if let's say a user is accessing it? Think about really hard one more time. The answer would be no, it is not the same. Because if an admin or an administrator or super user or root or whatever user that is higher privileged than some other users can access a page updated something, that is with the privilege of that user, hence why it is not the same type of functionality. Trust cautiously is another thing that is very interesting. Um, uh, if you have a lot of entities, unknown entities, how do you know that they are secure? Okay, so let's change the page to this one. It is a very interesting picture, just something I found someplace on Google, so I hope it's all right if there's an owner looking at it. Trust cautiously is basically all about that you are some system and you need to trust all the different co connectivities there are between your computer and how can you be certain that the way they are handling your data is just as secure as you are handling it. You cannot do that. So you kind of need to find a way to enable that trust. Uh, look at the questions. What can access our database? What libraries do we use from where? Who are you? How do we know? What is connecting to our services? What are we connecting to? Those are the questions you need to answer. Just to go back just a tad, you can see that the trader of all the kind of things is operational complexity. However, in most occasions, it's a fine line you need to put in your software, how much or how little. You cannot just say all the way or nothing. That will lead to, to, to a failure of implementing security. Simplest solution possible. There's a saying, the price of reliability, reliability is a pursuit of, of the utmost simplicity. Well, that is true. Simplest solution possible is about achieving a design that is not complex, but is simple of design. To solve whatever type of functionality that is needs to be solved, this is what this is design principle is all about. Doesn't mean that you cannot be um, advanced. Doesn't mean that you cannot have complexity in your code. It does not mean that. It basically means that you need to make sure that it's easy to understand your design and it is a really good idea to understand that complexity is really difficult to understand. If no one can understand what you're doing, there's a really good chance that you might end up with errors, which could lead to vulnerability. Audit sensitive events. All right, so whenever something interesting happens to your application, let's say that you have a brute force attack going on. How would you verify that that is happening if you don't audit your events? How would you verify that, that some, some hacker is trying to uh, brute force your way into your Windows server? Do you look into your event logs? Don't you? If you don't, you should do that. It's a really good idea to have some sort of control set up to look and monitor your sensitive events. Fail securely or use secure defaults. Very interesting design pattern. Fail securely is all about, okay, let's, let's think about it this way. How would you feel about being in a building that is set to fire? Everything is burned off. The cables is burned. 
the system had one choice to make before it shut down. Should it fail with the doors closed or the doors opened? What would you prefer? You're trapped inside a building. You know the, the, the fire cannot enter the rooms. Would you rather be inside the rooms or would you rather say that you would like the doors to be opened? Fail securely is a choice you make. How should your system fail? A secure way to fail is something that is not easy to do, which is why the trade-off is convenience. Never rely upon obscurity. I see this far too much. People trying to hide the stuff with weird names, weird coding, weird encodings and so on. Now this doesn't just, um, this is not just about having a path, something to web page. You know, I, I see programmers create their own fancy session libraries and they think, oh, this is so smart because what I do is, 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 is I take base64, encode my, my, my whatever secret string, and then I put some number behind it or something like that. You know, everyone will see it really easy. If you have an interest in trying to crack some sort of session management or session manager, you will notice that the obscurity is, is real and you will try and break it. Implement defense in depth. This is probably a more popular one than most people might know. Defense in depth is all about saying every time we have a possible vulnerability. And what is that? What is a possible vulnerability? Let me just be clear about that. A login functionality is a possible vulnerability. If you can log into a system and, give a and get access to some data, that is a vulnerability. You need to protect your login. Yeah, I know you know, people don't see it as a vulnerability, but it is a vulnerability. It is a possible access for hackers to your system. Defense in depth on a login is, for example, that you are protecting your login with, of course, something you know, maybe some biometrics, multi-factor authentications, maybe even use some recapture of some sort, even though that it can be broken pretty easy. You're not relying on a single point of, of, uh, of uh, security. You are putting multiple layers on. So every time you have a possible uh, vulnerability, you try and protect it with multiple different layers. So it's getting less possible for a malicious user or hacker to get access to a system. This is a really good, interesting picture of defense in depth and not to be confused with the defense in depth principle that it is not about putting as much defense in every single corner that is on your application. It is only the places where you, through some really good risk assessment, that is the first thing you do, uh, located the possible vulnerabilities and those are being defended in depth. That is how you should use it. Fort Knox is just one big fort that they implement defense in depth and this is what this picture basically means. Now, this is another thing that I see a lot. Never invent security technology. I uh, I see it every day. You know, I see libraries being shipped out. I see uh, popular pages like, um, uh, I don't quite remember the name, but there are some pages that, that, that enable anyone to ship out their own third party or their own library created with some sort of session manager or login or authorization or authentication or way to handle database data, way to do backup and many different things, you know, not verified uh, systems, just some third party, some, you know, guy in a cellar or whatever. And the thing is with, with, the, with this kind of invented security technologies is that they don't work. Don't do it. Don't rely on invented security rely on what is tested, what is used, and be the boring programmer that sticks to the same old library that is proved over and over again. That is what this is all about. And the last one is called find the weakest link. Now, it is a really interesting problem. Think about a wall. Which brick in the wall is the weakest? If you can break that brick, there's a really good chance that you can break the other brick beside it because then you have suddenly got a hole in the wall. Finding the weakest link in, let's say, a web application is not an easy task, but it is also not impossible. 
you need to map out all your uh, sensitive information, all your critical functionalities. And I would say a really good idea to do that is to look at the source code, talk to programmers, talk to users, talk to testers, maybe even hire some pen testers, you know, get the whole team going, find the weakest links. And I'm saying in plural links, there might be more than one. All right. The last page is just an exercise. So if you want to use this exercise for your teaching or in your class, feel free to use it. And in the very end, I have some sources, building and security and viewpoint and perspectives and info. If you want to look at some of the sources I used for this slideshow. So as of always, I hope you like this video. I hope you will subscribe and like to your, my channel and click the bell to get not notifications of future videos. Bye. Thank you.